for the uh, MillerCom 06 series, and on behalf of the International Programs and Studies, the Program in Arms Control, Disarmament, and International Security, and 20 other co-sponsoring campus units, it's my very great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, John Brady Kiesling. His name will be familiar for those of, to those of you uh, who are uh, watch the press carefully. He, he was one of the relatively rare voices of dissent from within the Department of State. At the time, we were engaged in something of a national frenzy of anticipation over the upcoming war with Iraq. It was February 27th of 03 that Kisling's letter of resignation addressed to Colin Powell was published in the New York Times, terminating his uh, very distinguished 20 years and awarded 20 years of diplomatic service, uh, having served in Morocco, Armenia, Israel, and Greece. In that letter, he wrote what has become a credo for his message to other audiences like this across the country, and I quote, the policies we are now asked to advance are incomparable, not only with American values, incompatible, not only with American values, but American interests. Our fervent pursuit of war with Iraq is driving us to squander the international legitimacy that has been America's most potent weapon. We have begun to dismantle the largest and most effective web of international relationships the world has ever known. Our current course will bring instability and danger, not security. Thus concluded his career at state. Thus began the past two and a half years of public advocacy to alert audiences to the short-sightedness of US unilateralism, of preemptive strikes, of prescripted warfare made for the media, and the waning of American moral authority across the globe. That resignation letter concluded with his reason for taking to the lecture circuit and being here tonight. I have hope, he wrote, that in a small way I can contribute from the outside to shaping policies that better serve the security and prosperity of the American people and the world we share. It is this optimism that he still maintains the optimism that we can return to a position of positive global influence that motivates his presence with us today. Join me in welcoming John Brady Kisling, who will be speaking tonight on After Iraq, U.S. Diplomacy, and the Crisis of International Legitimacy. John. Um, thank you very much, Professor Stewart. Um, I'm very happy to be here this evening. Uh, most of the past year, I've been locked in a little room in Athens trying to finish a book. Um, writing a book is hard. Um, and when you're locked in a room, it's very good for your analytical detachment. But at a certain point, you need to get out of the room and remind yourself what your book is for. And the book is, is for you here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ACTIS, the Program in Arms Control, Disarmament, and National Security, for inviting me. Uh, thanks, Matt Rosenstein. Thank you, Professor Palmore. Uh, thank you, Sheila Roberts. Thank you. At any rate, it's, it's great to be here. The book, when it comes out next summer, I hope, is called Diplomacy Lessons, Realism for an Unloved Superpower. It's a book about relearning the ancient and honorable art of diplomacy. Um, the message of the book can be construed as either uplifting or horribly cynical, depending on your perspective. Um, but basically, what I try to argue is that in order for America to defend its narrow, selfish national interests in a cost-effective way, we have to behave as a well-informed, law-abiding, moral superpower. Uh, and that's sort of a, you know, it, it's a conundrum, but uh, the reality is uh, we have to pretend to be moral if we're not, even if we're not. Um, all right, tonight I'm here to talk about repairing the damage from America's failed intervention in Iraq. Now, I wish I could be here instead offering you a magic solution to Iraq. Uh, if such a magic solution existed, 
I wouldn't be here, though. I'd be still in the State Department fighting to make it happen. I mean, it would be the job of every patriotic American to, to, you know, to fix what we broke. But I, I don't see it happening. I, honestly, I don't. The options are very ugly. We can leave Iraq and watch one kind of civil war develop from the outside, or else we can stay there and be part of a rather different civil war. The political basis that once existed for a unified Iraq is almost completely destroyed, but not absolutely destroyed. So the option of partitioning the country, which is effectively what happened in Bosnia, though it would probably save lives, it's not really open to us. We don't have the moral and the political authority to, to do that kind of partitioning. Now, the US military is very good at what it does. It can prevent any given faction from winning a civil war, but it cannot prevent the Iraqi people as a whole from losing that war. You know, meanwhile, the world is watching Iraq, and the world does not like what it sees. Foreigners, I learned in the course of 20 years, are, are just as polite as, as you Americans are, we Americans are. If somebody, you know, if, if, if President Bush is to go and ask foreigners point blank, you know, they will simply not tell him the honest truth about America's current standing in the world. You know, this is why a prudent president will have a few diplomats, a few sort of stooped, unthreatening people in bad blazers whose job is to go and listen to foreigners sort of respectfully and watch their TV shows and read their newspapers. Now, when you do that, what you discover is um, that in the process of trashing Iraq, we have also trashed most of the world's ability to accept that the America has a legitimate right to manage the, the, the planet for them. This is, this is really bad, and I say this not as some kind of patriotic sentimentalist, though in some ways I am. I say this as a, someone trying to be a very hard-nosed realist, someone who says that America has got to protect the security and prosperity of the American people. To pr protect the security and prosperity of the American people, the United States government either needs to be providing le le legitimate leadership for the world, or else it's got to find someone else who can. Now, why is this? Well, look at Katrina. Katrina is a foretaste of the likely future that's waiting for us. Societies, I think all societies, are living in a very precarious balance with their environment. In most of the world, the delicate equilibrium of the population with the environment is now so fragile that it can be toppled not just by you know, massive global warming, but even by ordinary climatic variation. Um, America's interests are served when foreign states are able to provide their citizens with sustainable development, with education, with public health, with democratic values. When states flourish, their citizens buy our jet airplanes and our DVDs. They send their kids to our universities. They, you know, they export their capital to keep our consumer society afloat. When states fail, instead they export terrorism, they export disease, and they export a chain reaction of environmental destruction elsewhere. The United States is simply not capable of building levees high enough to wall itself off from the economic and political consequences of global environmental catastrophe. America is the largest consumer of the world's wealth. America becomes inevitably a consumer of the world's catastrophes. Okay. The US government, even with centuries of tradition and public consensus behind it, does not feel it can legitimately ask American voters to pay taxes to sustain the services it provides. It will not impose energy conservation or sensible land use or health care. If we Americans have such an unimpressive record, picture the weak, undemocratic governments in the developing world. They are helpless on their own to protect the, the long-term carrying capacity of their territory from the natural, legitimate behavior of their citizens. 
People have a right to pursue happiness. We are not going to deny them that. Uh, if people are going to pursue their individual happiness, though, you need a state that can set rules that limit the damage from that. The key to governance, whether it's local, national, or global, is legitimacy. And now I'll try to def define what I mean by that. And I have to apologize because I'm not a political scientist. I'm a, I'm a diplomat, you know, kitchen version of theory, a kitchen version of international relations, a little pop evolutionary psychology, sort of a grab bag of things. And I'm sure I will offend everybody in the room, including, I regret to say, this is a land-grant university. You have a big agricultural department still. Is there anyone from animal husbandry in the room? OK, I'm safe. OK, here is my, here's my metaphor. I'm not sure it works yet. I'm still playing with it. But uh, a year ago, three friends and I hiked into a Portuguese custom, which is called the Chega de Bois, the showdown of the bulls. The Chega de Bois is an entertaining way of choosing breeding stock by having two bulls fight for dominance. We wandered into this custom. We followed the local champion who was dressed in black. He weighed about a ton and had very nasty horns, but he let himself be switched along the path by two kids with sticks. His out-of-town rival, the Red, was waiting in the pasture. When enough spectators had paid their five euros, the black bull was led into the pasture and primal instinct took over. And primal instinct is pretty thrilling to watch, I have to say. Uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, the two bulls pushed each other back and forth. The black bull was more experienced, and the red bull was heavier and uh, was in possession of the pasture and determined not to be defeated. And this began to look like a very scary stalemate. You know, black totally lost his bladder control, and red was panting uncontrollably. Meanwhile, the flies were eating both of them, and they were, you know, they were in serious trouble. You know, in an ideal world, one bull is smart enough to recognize that it's been beaten and it'll take to its heels. But bulls are not bred to be smart. Um, and sometimes both bulls die on the field. And when that happens, it's a very expensive lesson to, the, to their owners that um, strength and aggression are not the same thing as reproductive fitness. Uh, you know, it's a good lesson for all of us. Um, anyway, it's, suddenly, when things were just totally deadlocked, the old rancher stepped forward. He just shouted and waved his stick and told the bulls that the fight was over. And it was amazing. They just turned, went off into the bushes, and started scratching their fly bites. Uh, and they, were, they looked grateful for his intervention. Um, you know, the other spectators were, you know, were kind of disappointed. And they were sort of hoping for blood. They were hoping for this primal scene. And you know, I was just sort of pathetically relieved. You know, I needed, as a diplomat, to be reminded that there is something more than horns and, te and testicles at work in the world. Even in the grip of their most primal and deadly instincts, bulls will submit to outside control that need not be any more lethal than a stick and a shout. Now, human beings, as we all know, are far more deadly animals than bulls are. Human beings can be herded, too, easily and gratefully by a policeman with a stick, or a priest with a book, or a politician in a dark suit. What I mean by legitimacy here is whatever it is that makes us herdable. Now, human beings have very powerful rules of how to behave. Some part of our behavior is genetic. It's instinctive and universal. Some of it's learned and specific to our tribe or you know, ourselves as individuals. Whatever the rules are, and however we come to accept them, a working majority of us are conditioned to feel some dim biochemical reward when we know the rules and we obey them. And we feel righteous anger at other people who don't obey the rules. Now, bulls learn to obey the people with the stick. Americans learn to stop their cars at stop signs, even when the intersection is empty and there are no policemen near. A stop sign has legitimacy. The President of the United States has enormous legitimacy. When the President of the United States gives, gives an order, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, the men and women of the US government will eagerly, will happily move heaven and earth to make it, make it happen. 
You know, legitimacy for most of us sounds like a valid value judgment. And you have to realize that it's, it's not. It's purely practical. It's an empirical attribute of human behavior. Saddam Hussein was legitimate to a very large number of Iraqis. So was Hitler to most Germans. Their commands were obeyed willingly and energetically by subordinates. Each of those subordinates had some specific set of rational and irrational and instinctive reasons that were powerful enough to attract ordinary day-to-day -day morality as a guide to their behavior. One thing to know, you know, le legitimacy is local. It's situational. You know, a stop sign has very strong, clear legitimacy in its specific con uh, context of an Illinois road intersection. It means something very different hung on your dorm room wall. In Athens, a stop sign is just one factor, like gender, like class, like vehicle size, in a, in a permanent, you know, renegotiated contest of dominance and, and submission between rival drivers. It's a lot of fun to watch, um, like the bulls. But legitimacy is vital for the effective functioning of human or any other societies. You know, predictably, Greeks have a lot more traffic fatalities uh, per passenger mile than Americans have. In general, you can say that America is prosperous and successful compared with most of the world because its institutions are seen by the vast majority of the American people as legitimate. Enough of us accept laws and taxes to sustain the kind of social, social infrastructure that allows a whole bunch of us to live crowded together very densely. Obviously, there are a lot of sources of legitimacy in the world. Law and religion are the ones we tend to think about. But the really powerful and universal ones are the instinctive strategies that we share with the baboons, basically. Now, these are the, the attributes you'd expect to see in any little group of hunter-gatherers, at least anyone that survives a few hundred thousand years. Things like group loyalty, conformity, and strict reciprocity are survival strategies that work. You know, in the real world, world, they keep a group functioning. Turns out that territoriality, like with dogs and wolves, is hardwired into us as well. I'm not going to go over the next hundred thousand years of human evolution, but um, Human beings, it turns out, are relentlessly nationalistic. In its current form, nationalism is a very modern phenomenon, just a couple hundred years old. But, you know, and it, and it may not last forever. I, and I think it's, it's something that will evolve into something else over time. But for the moment, we have to understand that nationalism is vital to, to dealing with the international world we live in. And I learned about nationalism the hard way as a young American diplomat in Athens. Greece is a military ally of the United States. It's a country tied to us by a hundred, well, sorry, a, a million odd Greek Americans, by t uh, shared democratic values, by mutual self-interest. Greece is also a country of only 11 million people. The United States is a country of 280 odd million. Logic says that no reasonable U.S. request should be refused. But in fact, the default position for any Greek politician who wants to be reelected is to um, automatically refuse any American request. Um, why is that? Greek politicians are politicians. They are engaged in a brutal, personal uh, competition with their political rivals. They rapidly discover in politics that the most reliable source of legitimacy in the struggle against their rivals is their perceived ability to protect the nation and its territory against outsiders. In Greece, the willingness to stand up with the irrational persistence to the polite requests of the superpower is taken by ordinary people as proof of fitness to protect the herd. And if you looked at the, at the 2004 U.S. elections, you'd probably recognize some of the same tendency in uh, the United States as well. Now, nationalism is real. It's almost universal. It's an issue. Working patiently with local politicians in Greece, America was always able to get those things it really needed. 
generally after months of years of very patient diplomacy. Diplomacy and negotiations that was designed to prove to the Greek public that America's superpower status had nothing to do with the Greek decision to do what we asked. In other words, the Greeks had to prove, well, we have showed how tough we are, now we, we are going to do you a favor. Um, and most, uh, most foreigners are very much like Greeks in rejecting a priori the idea of being dictated to by any foreigner. And uh, if you've seen the US Congress at work, you'll recognize the same, the same phenomenon there as well. Now let me confess a very shameful secret. When I was in college many years ago, I, I played Dungeons and Dragons. Um, any Dungeons and Dragons players here? Don't be ashamed. Oh, I guess it died. OK. Well, you probably know what Dungeons and Dragons is. There's a very similar fantasy role-playing game that's popular in Washington. Nowadays, the um, the neoconservatives are the, um, are the chief expounders of it. In this fantasy game, US bureaucrats run the world. You know, we come up with a plan, Congress votes the money, the President of the United States waves his stick, shouts, and the fighting bulls return amiably to their respective pens and they hold democratic elections. Um, it really would be wonderful for the world if the United States could exercise on this global scale the authority that a simple Portuguese farmer has over his bulls. Unfortunately, nationalism makes it impossible. When the US president, in practice, gets caught up in our fantasy game and waves his stick, you know, the bulls will turn and look at him, hopefully, for a moment. They will sort of wonder to themselves, perhaps he's going to shoot the intruder in the pasture for me. Um, and then once he realizes that we're not, you know, he turns back and they lower their heads and charge again. Um, and this is very frustrating because um, I and my colleagues in the State Department worked, uh, well, I get, we always say 14-hour days, but they were, they were solid 11-hour days uh, um, trying to, to solve the conflicts, you know, that exist all over the world. We racked our brains. I, I, personally worked at various points on Israel, Palestine, Morocco, Western Sahara, Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, India, Pakistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and a bit on Bosnia. You know, my intentions were great, and the intentions of my bosses were great. You know, we genuinely wanted peace, stability, democracy, prosperity, justice, environmental protection, women's rights, I and mean, you name it. Um, and in the process of trying to solve these conflicts, we, we genuinely did a certain amount of good. You know, Bosnia is a, an example of when the United States stepped in, kind of late, after a lot of people had been killed, but we stopped other people from being killed, and um, you know, we, we achieved a status quo that was better than what there was. But can anyone here in the room suggest to me an international conflict that's genuinely been solved? in the past 50 years. Volunteers? I can think of one. What? Very good. You got it. You got it. So, well, I'll get to it in a moment. <laughs> OK. So why is it so difficult? Politicians everywhere in the world are locked in a legitimacy trap. At some very primitive level, it's impossible to resolve disputes with outsiders without somebody surrendering some part of the sacred soil or some part of the sacred national sovereignty. When you do that, you destroy your legit legitimacy as a leader. The only way that people have of recognizing that their leader is any good, well, there are two ways. First, perceived character. If you're tall, it's good. If you have the, the right shape of forehead, it's good. But you know, if you have this kind of steely glare, which, which President Bush has mastered, you know, then you're clearly strong. But, but really, the litmus test is, can you defend the nation? Can you be, are, are you tough enough against the foreigners? Um, those who, 
who make a deal, you know, a peace deal, those who accept the compromises necessary, you know, will be displaced politically by their rivals. Some of them will be killed, like at Rabin, unless in the process of making peace, the public has accepted that there is some higher legitimacy to which the nation as a whole has got to bow. Now, in our fantasy world, respect for U.S. military and economic power is a source of view of legitimacy. You know, foreigners look at us and say, well, the Americans want it, therefore it's okay. And we also have a tendency to believe that our ideology of freedom and democracy, which sounds very good and generally is pretty good, you know, that, that also gives us the right to intervene and have people accept our intervention. But in the real political world we live in, the power of outsiders simply does not function that way in the domestic politics of another state. In fact, um, the whole process of evolution, I mean, of, 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 of nationalism is a process of denying the legitimacy of outsiders, especially ideological legitimacy and legitimacy of violence. Um, we do have a source of legitimacy in the world, and it's a good one. And that is when there is a shared threat, there is an incredible legitimacy that comes from being a, a comrade in arms. And that exists at, at the lowest level of, of human behavior, you know, like the football team, and it, it scales all the way up. Um, during the Cold War, the shared fear of the Russians made us legitimate to a very large degree in Europe. We had the right to dictate policy, not on every issue, but on security issues. Um, but, um, but even there, even in the height of American power and influence, we've always, we've never been successful in our foreign interventions unless we have harnessed the local sources of legitimacy to achieve our goals. Diplomacy is about identifying and harnessing that legitimacy. In practice, that usually means working with local nationalism. If you look at the whole history of the Cold War and look at the wars that were fought, the wars the United States won, to the extent that we won any wars, were the wars where we identified ourselves better than the Russians did with local nationalist sentiment where the, the Russians did a better job, you know, we lost. And look at Vietnam, where it took until just a couple of years ago for McNamara to realize that he had been fighting a nationalist war against the Vietnamese, and of course we lost it. Well, I digress. I was absolutely certain um, from the moment I learned that the war in Iraq was going to happen, which was August of 2002 with Cheney's speech. It was obvious, it was obvious to me that the war would, would be a disaster. I had spent 20 years promoting democracy, human rights, and economic reforms around the world. The results of my efforts and of those of my colleagues, even in the countries where we were welcome guests rather than armed occupiers, were slow, gradual, and very, very fragile, too fragile to survive in a country like Iraq. And we had no brilliant vision of how to fix a broken state, you know, a state as badly broken as Iraq. More importantly, we did not have the legitimacy in the eyes of ordinary Iraqis or their neighbors to impose our vision, even if we had one. We could not use the methods that Saddam had used, and the Iraqis would quickly realize that we could not use those methods. We were thus certain to fail. That failure, I believed, would be a grave blow to America's ability to manage the world in service of our interests. In my letter of resignation, I wrote that after the shambles of post-war Iraq joins the shambles in Grozny and Ramallah, it will be a brave foreigner who forms ranks with Micronesia to follow where we lead. You know, with benefit of hindsight, I'm sorry I didn't say Gaza rather than Ramallah. I was in Ramallah a year ago. And Ramallah is actually in great shape, uh, except for the Arafat's headquarters, which is, you know, was destroyed. But, uh, um, but Iraq is definitely a shambles, not just in the modern meaning of a bloody mess, but in the literal 
you know, a traditional meeting of a slaughterhouse. You know, the world, unfortunately, got to watch Iraq dissolve into chaos, and they watched it on TV like we did. That chaos, unfortunately, we're not, we have no power to cure. The moral burden that we incurred there will haunt us for a long time. But there's another cost, which is the cost to America's fragile legitimacy in the eyes of the foreigners, in the eyes of foreigners that we are, in fact, the only natural and acceptable leader of the international community. When, as I said before, during the Soviet Union, because of the perceived threat to national survival, foreigners instinctively looked to the United States as their leader. Being seen as close to the United States was good domestic politics for all kinds of politicians. As long as the threat seemed real enough, America did not have to be a really you know, perfect, glossy superpower. We simply had to seem reasonably competent and affordable as a source of security. Fortunately, President Bush the Elder and President Clinton both recognized, I think out of instinct, that the disappearance of the Soviet threat meant that the United States could not maintain its legitimacy on that basis. None of our close allies with the demise of the Soviet Union faces any real military threat at all. None of them is likely to face a military threat for the next couple of decades anyway. In the absence of that threat, the number of the circumstances in which any European country will allow any outside dictation is very limited. In practice, when the United States wants to lead the so-called free world, we can do it only when three conditions are met. When our national interests coincided with theirs, when the action could be defended as compatible with common sense morality and with international law, and when the United States committed a share of resources that was proportionate to the level of leadership that we, um, that we demanded. The restoration of Kuwait during Desert Storm is the perfect example of a successful US use of its legitimacy. Because we wrapped ourselves in the UN flag, the world rallied gratefully around US leadership. The results were, were superb. European leaders had no problem justifying their subordinate role. In Greece, where I was serving then, um, you know, the leftist opposition fought bitterly and assembled a crowd of weeping Greek mothers dressed in black to protect their children. But uh, you know, the Greek government said, no, we are going to follow the international community. They sent a frigate to the Persian Gulf and behaved completely appropriately. Surprised the hell out of me, actually, <laughs> given <laughs> given the, the, the politics of it, but no, they, we, in Desert Storm, we established a model of successful you know, American leadership of the world on a new sort of post-Soviet post model. As individuals, we surrender some of our sovereignty to the state and to the law. States will sometimes surrender a part of their sovereignty to international law, and to the pressure of the international organizations that they're members of. France and Germany solved their mortal zero-sum conflict over Alsace-Lorraine by creating the European Union as a non-territorial source of political legitimacy. It was one of the most amazing achievements in human history. I hope it lasts. The US spent most of the 20th century promoting the concept of international law as a binding instrument we created the United Nations partly in, out of a selfish desire to lock in the favorable status quo after World War II, but partly as a genuine idealistic experiment in creating an alternative source of legitimacy in the world. And by surrendering, uh, surrendering a tiny amount of our sovereignty to the United Nations, we made it legitimate for other countries to do the same. Bush the Elder and Clinton both understood the usefulness of international transnational institutions as a source of legitimacy for US intervention. When President Bush came to office, however, President the Younger, he saw himself first and foremost as leader of the American people. And this is normal and this is appropriate. But he was not sufficiently curious about the outside world. 
He did not give sufficient credit to the brilliance his father had shown in managing the transition away from a world organized by superpower rivalry. He was indifferent to the diplomatic skills that Clinton had used, skills that maintained the world's perception that America shared the values and aspirations of ordinary people everywhere. Very good politics. President Bush apparently assumed that American power and American values spoke for themselves. He had no personal experience in using American power overseas with foreigners. He did not know, I don't think he understood, how ugly and inefficient and very, very expensive it is to use raw American power in the world. All right, most of you have read the opinion surveys, I think. Uh, uh, in 80% of the countries whose opinions we care about, the US, the image of the United States after Iraq has plummeted to the lowest level since we began measuring back in the 60s. Um, and you know, the time of, as Iraq was building up, I was in Greece watching my closest Greek friends turning their backs on the United States. Their anger at the US slipped over for the very first time in my career into the ordinary personal relationships that every diplomat has. Um, I have to say that that was, had a profound effect on my ability to stay on as a diplomat when suddenly I had the friends who mattered to me in Greece, the ones that I had spent years cultivating as friends and as contacts, had taken a position, had developed a level of anger where, in this case, intellectually, I knew that they were right. Uh, it's not a good position to be in. But then we had a couple of, you know, the, there was a decision to go to war with Iraq, but then there was the debacle of failing to find weapons of mass destruction. Many foreigners insisted that America had lied knowingly in a grab for the world's oil resources. Others concluded that the US intelligence services were incompetent and that the United States cannot you know, you simply cannot be trusted as a source of reliable information about the world. The most powerful diplomatic tool I ever had in convincing Greeks of anything was the image of America's superior knowledge of the world. When we squandered that in Iraq, I lost incredible leverage. So did Colin Powell. So did almost, so did every American dealing really with any issue of American diplomacy. We had said something that turned out not to be true. They preferred to assume that we had lied than that, that we were mistaken, but as it, as it was, it, it cost us. Abu Ghraib, obviously, those photographs are known to every school child on the planet, practically. Um, the wave of revulsion that resulted around the world was amazing. Um, maybe it, I'm, again, all too, uh, influenced by the fact that I was in Greece with a very strong leftist press, but every newspaper in the world, I mean, they've the Abu Ghraib pictures have become an icon. You go to a little village in Turkey, you'll see those pictures on shop windows. Uh, the decision to withhold the uh, protections of the Geneva Convention from our prisoners of war from Iraq and Afghanistan, the violation of the US Constitution in holding American citizens indefinitely without charge, and the use of torture were incredibly damaging. The US has always been a country that could brag of its commitment to the rule of law. By sh saying that in this case, we were not in ourselves bound by the rule of law, we signaled to the rest of the world that there was not any longer a moral basis for the US claim of leadership. Okay, all right, the world was infuriated. Um, but it, I mean, what does it matter if the world's angry at us? You know, presumably, you know, it's not a popularity contest. We are a superpower. We are safe on our continent. What does it matter? Unfortunately, it does matter. In practical terms, and in practical political terms, which is the way I tend to see things, what we did by blackening America's image 
was to raise the domestic political cost to foreign politicians of cooperating with us. Politicians are cowards. All other things being equal, they prefer to be guided by their tracking poles. When the US was leader of the free world, politicians would follow us even on very debatable judgment calls, like, like Kosovo. Europeans were not at all happy with the way we, we pushed into that bombing campaign, but NATO loyally followed us, and NATO's involvement was crucial in the end in persuading the Serbs that they were in the wrong and, and, uh, and Europe was in the right, and we in Europe. Um, now that the US is an unloved superpower, however, Europe will follow us only when they are confident that we're right. I hate to say this, but in foreign policy, just as in real life, moral clarity is not something you bump into every day. Um, in the absence of moral clarity, Europe hesitates. When people hesitate, a lot of people end up dying unnecessarily who might have lived. I mean, there when you are going to intervene, you have to intervene quickly, sharply, in a consistent way. And we do not command that kind of response from, from our allies now. The world needs strong leadership, not often, but from time to time. Left purely to their own devices, an individual state will cut down its forests, pollute its rivers, let ep epidemics rage out of control, slaughter its minorities, and finally push a wave of young men across the border, maybe heavily armed, maybe simply starving. Um, this is not a good scenario. At the moment, the European Union has considerable economic power to influence normal states, that is, those states that still have working governments. But only the United States has the military and logistical capacity to stop a remote civil war in its tracks. No other country in the world, unaided, can field any sizable military force far from its borders for more than a few weeks. No other nation is entangled enough in the world that its politicians can persuade ordinary parents to send their sons and daughters into some distant jungle unless there's a very clear selfish as well as moral reason to do so. And the United States has amazing freedom of action. It, its citizens give the president an incredible ability to, to do what he likes with the US military. But if the United States is leading the world it can only lead it affordably if that leadership is seen widely as legitimate. Faced with US military power, the prudent response of any state is simply to go limp. A state that goes limp, a state that leaves a vacuum of legitimacy, becomes a disaster for its own people, but also ultimately for the world. Look at Haiti, look at Congo and Liberia, look at Iraq. America finds itself bound by the laws of physics and the laws of human nature. Power in the absence of legitimacy is simply too expensive. You cannot use it. You cannot pick up, you cannot pick up broken states and restore them with any credible you know, set of resources that we can mobilize. OK. US, because with Iraq, squandered the legitimacy that used to attach to our title of leader of the free world. President Bush, since the Iraq war, has, has changed course for the better on a number of issues. But speaking as an analyst now and not as a political rabble rouser, it is not possible for, for President Bush to regain for the US America's previous legitimacy in the world. It doesn't matter how brilliant, sensitive, diplomatic you know, he becomes, how thoughtful and wise American policies are. Human beings make their political decisions based on perceived character. A critical mass of foreigners in the world has reached a judgment that President Bush's values and aspirations conflict with theirs too badly. So he's, he's basically out of the game for the United States now. And this is, this is a loss because the, the President of the United States is the face and voice of America. When he's an effective spokesman of the US, 
he is a very powerful influence indeed. So the next US president, whichever political party it comes from, is very likely to claw back a lot of the ground we lost. Um, the world actually has an interest in uh, American legitimacy. Unfortunately, it will take him years of very expensive altruism, or else it'll take some world catastrophe that serves as a unifying force. While we are waiting for this to happen, when we need international legitimacy for some international intervention, we have no choice but to appeal to the traditional, well, not the traditional source, but the source of the previous 50 years, which is international organizations and international law. It's as a source of legitimacy for US intervention that the United States created the United Nations in 1945. It would be a source of legitimacy that all of its member states were bound by treaty to accept. In fact, in practice, when the United Nations Security Council speaks unanimously, states are able, you know, politicians are able to send their, their children into harm's way with zero domestic political cost, essentially, even when it's under US command. The UN mandate and the blue helmet are an excuse that even a totally selfish and corrupt politician can use to, to do the right thing. Now, everyone, of course, knows the limits of the UN. It's slow, it's weak, it's bureaucratic, it's somewhat corrupt, and it's incredibly frustrating to work with. Everyone agrees that it needs to be reformed. But successful reform has been blocked for many, many reasons, and not the least of those is US domestic politics. Um, we, ha we watched, a, we watched the, the latest best opportunity for ref UN reform die uh, this past month and the 60th uh, anniversary UN General Assembly Summit. As you're probably aware, John Bolton, who became our UN permanent representative um, by a recess appointment at the beginning of August, um, arrived, found a very large document that had been mostly reached by consensus and didn't like it submitted at the last minute you know, 700 odd um, amendments to it, which blew the thing out of the water. Um, the very painful compromises that had been reached, essentially we, we bribed the small states in the General Assembly with the offer of, of the Millennium Development Program. They agreed to some concessions we wanted, you know, toughening language on terrorism, an effort to strengthen the Security Council, an effort to reform human rights bodies alike. Anyway, most of, that, most of that ended up dying. The goal of Bolton and, and of his fellow conservatives is a pretty simple one. And their goal is to maintain America's complete freedom of action in the world. They believe that you do that by having a weak United Nations that, uh, uh, that cannot stop us. That goal, unfortunately, is completely un incompatible with America's more serious national interests, which is having some source of legitimacy for US intervention in the world. The UN's ability to be a source of legitimacy is based on its universality. Every sovereign state is a member, and every sovereign state can tell its people back home that in the United Nations, at least, it is the equal of the superpower. You know, we all know that sovereign equality is a lovely slogan. It's a myth in practice, but it's a very important myth. Without that myth, the United Nations does, cannot fulfill its chief function of legitimizing us. A successful superpower can work with the UN by spending the time and money and patience and frustration that it takes to pretend that it accepts the myth of sovereign equality. Without that pretense, no foreigner will accept our fitness to, to, you know, to, to turn the UN into our own instrument. Multilateral diplomacy requires a kind of patience we don't tend to have, unfortunately. The counterpart to sovereign equality is universal compliance. 
No leader will bind his country unless he can tell his people that others are similarly bound. When the US says publicly that it refuses to be bound by international law, then international law loses its ability to bind anybody. I have some thoughts on UN reform and how you make it real. Um, unfortunately, my thoughts are very unpopular because I believe that the only way that you can revitalize the United Nations and make it credible is by making the Security Council stronger, which means eliminating the ability of any one member to block actions. I believe that we need to expand the Security Council with additional permanent members, but dilute the, the veto, make it so it takes three permanent members instead of one to, uh, to veto anything. That will eliminate the current ability of Russia and China to kill any useful UN intervention. All right. I think it's a sacrifice we can afford to make. I think it's a sacrifice, in fact, that it's in our interest to make. Because any time the United States finds itself alone in the Security Council vetoing something, it's a sign we're about to do something really, really stupid. Um, I think I should save the rest of my UN reform for the, I think I've taken far too much time already, but let me just end with a plug for diplomacy as a career. Are there students in the room? Okay. How many of you have looked into taking the Foreign Service exam? All right, we need a few more. Um, we need a few more, why? To succeed as a superpower, ideally as a moral, virtuous, well-informed superpower, but if not, then at least as a superpower that pretends to be those things, we need very energetic, idealistic, insatiably curious young diplomats. Diplomacy is a fantastic intellectual adventure. It's a wonderful, challenging lifestyle. And it is one of the few things, few professions in the world where we can actually help people from time to time and, and, you know, and see it happen in our own lifetime. We never help them quite as much as we hope, and reality will eventually bite us in the butt. But we, we do something good. And we do have a Foreign Service officer sitting in the back who's on vacation from Baghdad. Uh, uh, you want to stand up and wave? <laughs> But um, let me just, this, uh, one last thing about, about being a diplomat. I mean, I, I, for me, the, the crucial characteristic is curiosity. Um, you've all grown up in an age of, of video games of global conquest. Skill in those games is not actually that useful. Um, <laughs> We don't live in a zero-sum universe. One of the implications of nationalism is that an American empire is too expensive to be worth having. It doesn't matter how brave and smart and lethal we are. You know, human nature is hardwired with certain basic moral notions, and imperialism violates those moral notions just by its very presence. Um, and the problem is with, with terrorism and such things, the weak had a very powerful political weapon to resist uh, imperialism and make it, make it no fun anymore. You will read stuff by the American neo-imperialists. They have no idea what they're talking about. They have clearly never dealt with any real foreigners in their own country, because if they had, they would not be saying these things. OK, so the purpose of US diplomacy is not to conquer or bully people, but rather to make it as cheap and easy as possible for foreigners to do what America needs them to do. Diplomats understand local nationalism. They work with it. They channel it. They understand and build the political, you know, the personal relationships that turn nationalism from being a deplorable, destabilizing, violent force into something that actually mobilizes people to work together for the common good. Um, I think we had a really optimism-inspiring event last weekend in, in, with the, in Beijing with the North Korean nuclear negotiations. It's not at all clear whether they've succeeded or not really, but just the sight of Chris Hill, um, Ambassador Hill is someone I have worked with a couple of times in the past, and, to someone so patient, calm, 
incredibly hardworking, um, able to listen to any kind of crap you know, from the North Koreans or anybody, and re remain calm, not get angry, just you know, factually deal with it. Um, he did a brilliant job of, we don't know if, if the, the Korean nuclear issue has been resolved. There's a framework agreement which has so many details left un unresolved that we, we won't know for a long time. But he has at least convinced our Asian partners that we are serious about diplomacy, we are a mature, responsible superpower that can be trusted a little more than it had been uh, two months ago with the fate of the peace of, of Asia. So and bravo to him, and I'm, I believe that it's a sign for the future of US diplomacy. I think it's a great time to, to test that out by taking the Foreign Service exam and giving it a whirl. So anyway, right, um, anyway thank you for listening to me, and uh, um, good, good luck. John has agreed to take questions, and there are two microphones here. Uh, would you please uh, identify yourself, and I'll let him handle the questions as they come forward. Please, go ahead, sir. I identify myself. My name is Kostas. So that gives me away as a Greek. Yes. Uh, so I want to tell you, when, uh, when friends of mine raised in America, they traveled to Greece, they come back telling me how fascinating the landscape is, but they also tell them that the average Greek is very anti-American. I, I uh, ask them, why do you think that? Uh, did they deny you service? Did they hit you? Did they report you to the authorities? No, they say they, they lecture me. They lecture me. <laughs> so I want you to comment a little bit. Are Greeks all that anti-American? Or are they giving Americans, like people raised here, the lecture that they ought to get by the professors or the media, or, yeah. Americans do need to be lectured by foreigners um, to some degree. The lecture Greeks tend to give is not the lecture I personally would give. Uh, I will say that. Um, but, but you're quite right that um, blaming Greeks for anti-Americanism because they, uh, they disagree with our policy and tell us so is it's the wrong label to use, and it's not a helpful label. In fact, Greece is, is an interesting country. As I, as I said in my talk, America plays a role in Greek domestic politics, which is a complicated, complicated and sometimes frustrating one. Um, people do play games with the US. There are politicians in Greece who rose to power by implying that they were protected by the Americans somehow and other people who rose to power by saying that they were you know, the only people who could resist the Americans. And in fact, all of them have similar policies in practice. If you get into a room with them privately with no TV cameras, you can do business perfectly well. And from that standpoint, the Greek anti-Americanism is not real. From the standpoint of how the United States plays in Greek domestic politics, however, and the complications that gives the US then you can say it, it is a problem. So, but it's, it's a definitional issue. And it's uh, one of my beefs at the embassy was all of the meetings we went to to moan about Greek anti-Americanism and try to figure out what public relations strategy would fix it. And I thought it was a doomed enterprise, partly because we're not very good at public relations, but more importantly, because the role that the, U, the US played in Greek society was so valuable to Greek society that unless we could come up with something to replace it with, they were not going to give it up. So you know, we, we just had to, to have a sort of sober sociological view of the situation. So. Um, hi, my name is Pooja. Um, how do you feel that America's place as a superpower will be affected by China and India like growing economically and also China's growing legitimacy in Asia? The biggest question facing America's ability to be a superpower is the economic question. 
no superpower in human history has ever been so dependent on the, the kindness of strangers to, to prop up our, our lifestyle. Um, the, our economy is not sustainable now. And technically speaking, you know, well, we are, and the Chinese are locked into an economic suicide pact, which assures some kind of stability, but is still uncomfortable. Um, I, China, we like to use China as a threat on the horizon because you need something to justify spending as much money on security as the rest of the world put together. Um, and China is the only threat on the horizon that makes any sense at all. Um, on the other hand, Chinese behavior so far does not lend itself to the belief that the China plans to confront us directly. Their force structure is designed to serve certain nationalist Chinese, I mean, certain Chinese nationalist aims in their immediate region. Um, we don't necessarily approve of them, but it's, it's not a direct threat to the United States. India is fascinating because at the moment, the Indians are doing a much better job than we are in multilateral diplomacy. Uh, India has, understands the importance of the UN and, and really plays that very well. Uh, we're, we're amateurs, frankly. Um, so if the Indian economy continues its current upward progress, I think um, we'll find ourselves unable to use a lot of the conventional levers of, of great power diplomacy, mostly the economic levers, because we'll find that our assistance levels just are not, not enough to compensate for the political and economic and other benefits that China, India, Japan, others can, can provide. So it's definitely a dilution of our power. The, the monopolar model is going to evaporate fairly fast. Dale Strau, um, you commented that, and I think we'd all agree, there are no good solutions in Iraq. Out of many bad possibilities to handle the situation, what would you suggest? Well, after a lot of agonizing, I came to the conclusion that the way to get some good out of all of this is to let the Kurds push for an independent state. I believe that one of the, the deadly flaws of the, the current Iraqi constitutional process is the, the need to accommodate you know, Iraqi, uh, sorry, Kurdish, Kurdish nationalism within an Iraqi state. And I, I think that the contradiction is too, too vast. You know, the problem with Iraq, with, the, with Kurdistan becoming independent is that the Turks will not allow that to happen. Um, my argument to that is that the Kurds can make a devil's bargain with Turkey, and if the Turks are smart, they'll, they'll take it. And the devil's bargain, bargain is for the Kurds to recognize that Kirkuk is going to have to, to go to the Turkmen and also that they're going to have to hand over to the Turks some of the PKK leadership. And it's a really ugly betrayal of a lot of uh, Kurdish leaders and principles. However, it might be enough to buy Turkish acquiescence to the deal. If Kurdistan, that sort of truncated Kurdistan, becomes independent, it changes the political dynamic in Iraq somewhat. The Essentially, I, and it, it, maybe this is even too cynical, but the current Sunni Shiite um, civil war turns rather against the Kurds as, you know, in an attempt to maintain sort of the, the integrity of the Iraqi state. It, it's a really Byzantine solution, and it's, it's an ugly one. But the, the good result is at the end, you do get a Kurdistan, which the Kurds have been dreaming about for, you know, a thousand years. And um, you take one party out of the, the political civil war in Iraq, 
give them a territory that's small but defensible, and then we defend them on that territory, which is, whereas we cannot defend them in Kirkuk. You know, we cannot, a civil war with dispersed populations simply cannot be fought effectively by the U.S. or by anybody else. I mean, sorry, that's it's not a nice solution, and I apologize for, but it's since you asked. My name is Irini. I'm also Greek, although that's not the point of my uh, question to you. And I'm also the result of American diplomacy. My grandmother was the wife of a diplomat. She's oh. sitting right there. <laughs> I'm half Greek, half American, so here I am. Um, I was actually kind of on the tails of your question, wondering whether there is any fear that we're going to pull out of Iraq prematurely and end up with an even larger mess that we're just going to dump on the global community. Well, I think we won't dump it on the global community because the global community is not going to accept it being dumped on it. Um, I honestly don't know. Our, the presence of the U.S. troops in Iraq is the center around which a lot of the opposition mobilizes, you know, this instinctive reaction to drive out the occupiers. If the occupiers leave, the, then the, the motives for the insurrection change fairly dramatically. Whether that means a smaller civil war or not, I, can, I don't know. I, the, the dynamics of Iraq are so complicated, I'm not sure anybody knows. I, I think it's unpredictable. I do know that our presence fuels one kind of civil war, so my opposition to pulling us out is... Uh, I mean, I, I feel we have a moral obligation to the Iraqi people, but I, I have no idea whether it's more moral to pull out or to stay in. I, but I, I'm tending now toward the idea that we pull out but, uh, or move into Kurdistan and protect the Kurds, who at least know that they want to be protected by us. And, uh, My name's Jim. I'm a student here at U of I. Um, I'm kind of wondering how I could go about encouraging other students on campus maybe to concern themselves a little more with issues about, you know, foreign issues and concerns across the world. That's a really good question. Does, does the university encourage people to spend a junior year or semester abroad? No, it doesn't. Well, some programs. Okay, how, how easy is it to do it? I mean, is there, is there money available or is there, and if you get them the right program, you can do it. Well, that's... So. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, we, we try and encourage people, but it's still, it's still really hard. There's still a lot of... I mean, other, I mean, I guess other than study abroad, is there any other pathway to take? Or? Well, one of the things... It's a criticism I've heard from foreign students increasingly about the U.S. is American universities are not making good use of their foreign students. The, the foreign students, especially lately, they tend to congregate with each other and have much less contact with, with the ordinary American students uh, than they expected or than they should have. Um, and this is a tragic loss for both sides because um, an American university education used to be the most powerful strategic asset we had in the world, and that we, we sent out to all over the world people who had basically imbibed uh, an American way of, you know, a sort of approach to problem solving, which in a lot of cases actually works pretty well, and also greater respect for, for the, the complexity of the U.S., less likelihood of being victim, victimized by conspiracy theories, you know, we had an ear that would, would listen more constructively, and, and, and American university graduates have been vital in reshaping the, the world over the past, uh, past 50 years. But if, if they go back to Greece or Turkey or wherever they go uh, with the feeling that they never talked to Americans or got to know them, you know, it's, it's a tragic loss. Um, I don't know, but I get the feeling that one of the, the problems is Americans are not very good at talking about politics. It's considered sort of rude. And 
Uh, it's in Greece. Every you know everybody talks about politics. I mean, you know, it's it's a spectator sport, and um, I, I get the feeling that that that's one of the problems. I, I think Americans need to realize that that politics is is it really is the only it's the only human subject. It's it's the subject of how human beings you know s survive together as social animals in effect, and uh, it should be. And you know, it should be the subject we talk about, and we should be prepared to get into really good, stimulating arguments with the uh, with the foreign students, and not get mad at them simply because they think our president was an idiot. Uh, because it turns out, it turns out this time they were right. <laughs> but sorry, I, I, I didn't really say that. But uh, um, uh, but anyway, this, uh, the, the, some thoughts. Uh, but. Uh, Constructive, practical things, I don't know, but invite your, the foreign student down the hall out for pizza and let him explain to you exactly what's wrong with America and thank him for it. Following up on that last point, even though the American president may have had some limitations, we have all the wonderful people like you in the State Department, and even some of the neocons have been experienced uh, you know, for a generation in Washington. What happened? How could we, how could our government fail like this? Well, well, my, what I'd say, my facile answer is they didn't listen to the diplomats. Um, but the problem is that diplomats are inherently schizophrenic. Overseas, our job is to establish relationships with foreigners to understand what they're thinking, to figure out how to how to work with them, how to use their own politics to serve American interests. And you, know, you succeed in diplomacy by being, by being humble, by being a good listener, by being infinitely curious, by going out and talking to all kinds of weird taxi drivers and the like. And, uh, uh, and when, you do, you know, when you do that, those habits of mind, that kind of humility is really good for convincing people that the United States is a worthy superpower. But then we are also, in addition to diplomats, we are bureaucrats. And as bureaucrats, we are living in a highly competitive ecosystem. We are competing for scarce resources for water and sunlight and soil with, with every other agency and within our own agencies. In that bureaucratic competition, the the traits that it takes to succeed are completely different traits. To succeed as a bureaucrat, you need to be self-assured, confident, highly energetic, and you know completely unapologetic. You have to, you know, you, you have to, to to learn these leadership skills, which actually President Bush is very good at. Um, you know, seeming to know what you're doing, not having any reservations, and the two, the two conflict badly. The people who have risen fastest in the Foreign Service are the ones who are the most energetic and self-assured, as opposed to the ones who learn languages and uh, and talk to foreigners a lot. Um, and you know, it's it's natural; it may be inevitable. But um, and, you know, and, and the thing is, some of them are really nice people, and the um, the the most senior diplomat in the State Department now, uh, Nick Burns. Uh, uh, is just a couple of years older than I, and a friend of mine. Uh, incredibly energetic, incredibly um, charismatic, nice to everybody, really appealing, but also incredibly competitive. And that competition made him, that competitiveness made him very good as a bureaucrat, but not particularly effective as an ambassador in a Greek setting. I mean, he was, he was, Presentable and, and you know did an okay job, but he was not one of the, the two or three outstanding ones. Though he is one of the, the two or three outstanding foreign service officers from the standpoint of of influence in Washington. So it, it's it, there are trade offs. How can we counter increasing rates of xenophobia within our own country? Well, that that I, I don't have. An answer to, and I mean it's a question of of leadership. One of the 
One of the vilest slanders that has been put about over the past three years since 9-11 is that the United States is a country at war. In fact, you know, and at war with some variety of Islam. Um, this, is, this is nonsense. A number of societies that happen to be Islamic are engaged in a number of wars, some of which use Islamic rhetoric as part of their mobilizing principle. The United States is involved in some of those wars, some of them because it serves US interests, some out of habit, some out of stupidity. 9-11 um, is a result of the US being involved in a war for the hearts and minds of the Saudi population. Um, I'm not sure we should be in that war, um, mostly because I'm not sure that we have something useful to contribute to it. At any rate, we, we, had, we have had some benefits from our presence in Saudi Arabia. We've sold them a lot of F-16s and other good stuff. And, uh, um, but we've also paid a price in the perception of a lot of very decent, God-fearing Muslims that uh, the United States is at war against truth and justice in the Middle East. Um, anyway, we need to walk away from the rhetoric of a war of civilizations. We need to recognize that religion you know, is a very convenient tool of politics. It's a very, well, it is a default source of legitimacy for societies that have run out of other sources. And one of the problems with Saudi Arabia, for example, is that the monarchy has been around a long time. It's very corrupt. Uh, the <clears throat> personal practices of it, some of its members are not appealing. Um, and. Um, and so there is a disconnect, there is a, a, a legitimacy gap there, and it is being filled at the moment not by what we would like, which is this westernizing, modernizing, sort of technological, d democratic approach, which unfortunately you, bad U.S. policy helped discredit, but rather by the Islamists. And you know, my, my real goal is to to end the war between, you know, the war, quote unquote, between Islam and Christianity, we have to reinvent the, the modernizing tradition of the United States as the spearhead of modernization in the world, as opposed to the bastion of the status quo. And when we are the force for progress and is seen and admired from outside as, as, a, as you know, the place where progress happens, then I think that war will, will disappear. Anyway, that's my long-term solution. I, I wonder uh, if before we adjourn, I could just simply say that um, we're going to be exploring at the University YMCA as a part of the Friday Forum, the conscience of a diplomat tomorrow. Our speaker will be a part of a series on conscience in action. So at 12 o'clock tomorrow at the University of YMCA, we'll have a chance to uh, talk further and learn uh, how conscience, whatever it is, uh, motivates a diplomat and how we can put conscience in action on behalf of peace and justice in the world. So plan to come tomorrow, 12 o'clock, University of YMCA. You can get lunch there and be with us uh, for the lecture. And for plugs I was planning to put in. Thank you. Uh, the second is those of you with questions that remain tomorrow on Focus 580 at, tell me what time? 10 o'clock. Uh, our speaker will again be available for your questions. We're working him well. Thank you very much very, uh, for your attendance and thank you, John, for uh, a stimulating evening. Roll.